Religion, Not the Crying Need of India, 20th September 1893 Christians must always be ready for good criticism, and I hardly think that you will mind if I make a little criticism. You Christians who are so fond of sending out missionaries to save the soul from the heathen, why do you not try to save their bodies from starvation? In India, during the terrible famines, Thousands died from hunger, yet you Christians did nothing. You erect churches all through India, but the crying evil in the East is not religion. They have religion enough, but it is the bread that the suffering millions of burning India cry out for with parched throats. They ask us for bread, but we give them stones. It is an insult to a starving people to offer them religion. It is an insult to the starving man to teach him metaphysics. In India, a priest that preached for money would lose caste and be spat upon by the people. I came here to seek aid for my impoverished people, and I fully realized how difficult it was to get help for heathens from Christians in a Christian land. Buddhism, the fulfillment of Buddhism, 26 September 1893. I am not a Buddhist as you have heard, and yet I am. If China or Japan or Ceylon follow the teachings of the great master, India worship him as God incarnate on earth. You have just now heard that I am going to criticize Buddhism, but, but by that I wish you to understand only this. Far be it from me to criticize him whom I worship as God incarnate on earth. But our views about Buddha are that he was not understood properly by his disciples. The relation between Hinduism, by Hinduism I mean the religion of the Vedas, and what is called Buddhism at the present day is nearly the same as between Judaism and Christianity. Jesus Christ was a Jew and Shakyamuni was a Hindu. The Jews rejected Jesus Christ, nay crucified him, and the Hindus have accepted Shakyamuni as God and worship him. But the real difference that we Hindus want to show between modern Buddhism and what we should understand as the teachings of Lord Buddha lies principally in this. Shakyamuni came to preach nothing new. He also, like Jesus, came to fulfill and not to destroy. Only in the case of Jesus, it was the old people, the Jews, who did not understand him while in the case of Buddha, it was his own followers who did not realize the import of his teachings. As the Jew did not understand the fulfillment of the Old Testament, so the Buddhists did not understand the fulfillment of the truths of the Hindu religion. Again, I repeat, Shakyamuni came not to destroy, but he was the fulfillment, the logical con conclusion, the logical development of the religion of the Hindus. The religion of the Hindus is divided into two parts, the ceremonial and the spiritual. The spiritual portion is specially studied by the monks. In that, there is no caste. A man from the highest caste and a man from the lowest may become a monk in India, and the two castes become equal. In religion, there is no caste. Caste is simply a social institution. Shakyamuni himself was a monk, and it was his glory that he had the large-heartedness to bring out the truths from the hidden Vedas and throw them broadcast all over the world. He was the first being in the world who brought missionaring into practice. Nay, he was the first to conceive the idea of proselytizing. The great glory of the master lay in his wonderful sympathy for everybody, especially for the ignorant and the poor. Some of his disciples were Brahmins. When Buddha was teaching, Sanskrit was no more the spoken language in India. It was then only in the books of the learned. Some of Buddha's Brahmin's disciples wanted to translate his teachings into Sanskrit, but he distinctly told them, I am for the poor, for the people, let me speak the language of the people. And so to this day, the great bulk of his teachings are in the vernacular of that day in India. Whatever may be the position of philosophy, whatever may be the position of metaphysics, so long as there is such a thing as death in the world, so long as there is such a thing as weakness in the human heart, 
so long as there is a cry going out of the heart of man in his very weakness, there shall be a faith in God. On the philosophical side of disciples of the great master, dashed themselves against the eternal rocks of the Vedas and could not crush them. And on the other side, they took away from the nation that eternal God to which everyone, man or woman, clings so fondly. And the result was that Buddhism had to die a natural death in India. At the present day, there is not one who calls himself a Buddhist in India, the land of its birth. But at the same time, Brahminism lost something. That reforming zeal, that wonderful sympathy and charity for everybody, that wonderful leaven which Buddhism had brought to the masses and which had rendered Indian society so great that a Greek historian who wrote about India of that time was led to say that no Hindu was known to tell an untruth and no Hindu woman has known to be unchaste. Hinduism cannot live without Buddhism, nor Buddhism without Hinduism. Then realize what the separation has shown to us that the Buddhist cannot stand without the brain and philosophy of the Brahmins, nor the Brahmin without the heart of the Buddhist. This separation between the Buddhist and the Brahmins is the cause of the downfall of India. That is why India is populated by 300 millions of beggars and that is why India has been the slave of conquerors for the last thousand years. Let us then join the wonderful intellect of the Brahmins with the heart the noble soul, the wonderful humanizing power of the great master. Address at the final session, 27th September, 1893. The world's parliament of religions has become an accomplished fact and the merciful father has helped those who labored to bring it into existence and crowned with success their most unselfish labor. My thanks to those noble souls whose large hearts and love of truth first dreamed this wonderful dream and then realized it. My thanks to the shower of liberal sentiments that has overflown this platform. My thanks to this enlightened audience for their uniform kindness to me and for their appreciation of every thought that tends to smooth the friction of religions. A few jarring notes were heard from time to time in this harmony. My special thanks to them, thanks to them for they have by their striking contrast made general harmony the sweeter. Much has been said of the common grounds of religious unity. I am not going just now to venture my own theory, but if anyone here hopes that this unity will come by the triumph of any other of the religions and the destruction of the others to him I say, brother, yours is an impossible hope. Do I wish that the Christian would become Hindu? God forbid. Do I wish that the Hindu or Buddhist would become Christian? God forbid. The seed is put in the ground and earth and air and water are placed around it. Does the seed become the earth or the air or the water? No. It becomes a plant. It develops after the law of its own growth, assimilates the air, the earth and the water, converts them into plant substance and grows into a plant. Similar is the case with religion. The Christians is not to become a Hindu or a Buddhist, nor a Hindu or a Buddhist to become a Christian. But each must assimilate the spirit of the others and yet preserve his individuality and grow according to his own law of growth. If the parliament of religions has shown anything to the world, it is this. It has proved to the world that holiness, purity and charity are not the exclusive possessions of any church in the world and that every system has produced men and women of the most exalted character. In the face of this evidence, if anybody dreams of the exclusive survival of his own religion and the destruction of the others, I pity him from the bottom of my heart and point out to him that upon the banner of every religion will soon be written in spite of resistance, help and not fight, assimilation and not destruction, harmony and peace and not dissension.